Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started and be respectful for those of you who are joining us online. We want to thank you for participating in this very important discussion. My name is Terry Kimball. I'm the president and CEO here at the Chandler Chamber. And we are really pleased to be able to bring you this topic because it is really, really critical, um, not only for Chandler, but for Arizona as a whole. So, and I can't wait for you to hear this powerful panel of speakers. So we do have a full agenda. Um, public policy here at the Chandler Chamber is extremely important to us, um, as well as our businesses here. And these events would not be possible if it wasn't for our sponsors. And I'd like to thank Air Products and Chemicals, Salt River Project, Dignity Health Chandler Regional Medical Center, Intel, Catalyst Computer Technologies, Southwest Gas Company, Edward Jones, Terry McKibben, APS, and Dragon Walk Pine Chinese Restaurant. So without further ado, I would like to um, introduce our 2022 board chair, Mr. Rick Human from CMA, to say a few words on behalf of the board and introduce our committee chair. Thanks, Terry. Hey, read the scripts. Um, yeah. <laughs> First, I just want to welcome everybody here today. We have a great turnout. This is a super important topic for everybody. Um, with transportation being so important in the valley as we continue to grow, and without the uh, extension of Prop 400, um, it's going to be a big problem. So uh, we have some great speakers today. Um, but it's my pleasure to introduce today's facilitator. Um, Eileen Cruz is the Senior Government Relations Representative with SRP. She's been a member of the Arizona-Mexico Commission since 2011, appointed by the Arizona governor, and currently serves as co-chair of the Energy Committee. She has served as the director of the Chandler Chamber of Commerce Board since 2020, has been named one of the 40 Hispanic leaders under 40 by Val Del Sol in Univision, Arizona in 2014. In her free time, she enjoys traveling, hiking, taking pictures, and spending time with her children. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody? Happy Friday. <laughs> All right, our, next, uh, our first speaker is Aga Custer Thomas. Thank you for joining us today. So exciting to hear from you. A proud graduate of Texas A&M University, Aga became active in public policy as an intern for a Texas congressman. After serving in Washington, D.C., Aga earned graduate degrees in public administration and political science from the University of Houston. She worked for the Woodlands, Texas, on policy and led a historic governance project that prevented the community's annexation. In 2015, Adra joined my co Association of Governments to facilitate long-range transportation planning efforts for the nation's second largest metropolitan planning organization, 10,659 square miles. Previously, Audra worked for Partners for Strategic Action, a Fountain Hills-based community planning firm, Audra grew up on a family farm in southeastern Minnesota, fostering her interest in agriculture and natural resource policy issues, and continues to hold an interest in the family's cattle business, GBF Herefords. Please uh, welcome Audra to the microphone. Well, good morning, and on behalf of the 32 member agencies, our mayors, uh, supervisors, Native Nation presidents, uh, for inviting the Maricopa Association of Governments here today to talk about this extremely important issue. I had dreams of coming here and speaking with you in a completely different kind of context um, and getting ready for a November election for the continuation of this important dedicated asset sales tax. Um, but here we are, and I uh, wanted to use this opportunity to set um, our uh, regional leadership up after me to talk about the implications and what's next um, after the, the shocking veto by Governor Ducey of House Bill 2685, which would have permitted Maricopa County voters the opportunity to choose whether or not to continue this dedicated half cent sales tax. My presentation today will talk a little bit about history, uh, reorient on how important this tax has been for uh, the economic prosperity and growth we've experienced here in the state of Arizona and principally here in the region, and then talk about the implications 
Uh, I think a lot of us are focused on the long-term implications of not having a dedicated revenue source uh, out into the year 2050. But there are some very dramatic, very near-term impacts as well that we wanted to make sure that you were aware about to really underscore the sense of urgency to find resolve. Uh, the dedicated half cent sales tax was first conceived by mayors back in the early 80s. How many of you have been here for that long? All right, good. That's good context, I think, for today's conversation. Uh, the it, region was growing very rapidly, and uh, mayors couldn't wait on uh, the state for a resolution to transportation funding for needed high capacity transportation investments, and there certainly wasn't the funding resources available at the federal level that perhaps um, our sisters in the East Coast had benefited from for generations. And so they decided to come together, work together, um, tax themselves to establish a high capacity transportation system for the region, uh, at that time known as Proposition 300, uh, passed by voters overwhelmingly in 1985, um, and really set course not only a major funding and uh, transportation initiative just for this region, but it was one of the first in the country. It is now a model replicated uh, throughout the country, all of our peers leverage local tax initiatives just like this, in fact, stack them, uh, outpace us in spending at a local level because they recognize how instrumental it is to economic development, quality of life factors. <clears throat> to reorient you on how just important this tax has been, really to the development pattern and prosperity we've seen in this region. This is what our transportation network looked like back in 1986. I-17 uh, cut through the region north-south, but even Interstate 10 hadn't been completed through Phoenix. It's an interstate that goes coast to coast, ocean to ocean. Its last segment was built here in Phoenix, and that was in the early 1990s. What you'll see is sections of US 60 as well, and that was it. Uh, we were relying, you were relying on some arterial streets to get across the region at that time. And this is really the impetus ultimately to mayors getting together that in other states, the state's Department of Transportation would have facilitated this investment, but mayors knew they couldn't wait any longer to service their constituents, and got together to pass Proposition 300. And this is what Proposition 300 built. What we know today is the loop system, including Loop 101 and 202, uh, 143 uh, through the airport, 51 as well. Um, really the ultimate framework for growth and development throughout this region, um, and really the region why the, uh, the Phoenix metropolitan area is the economic engine for the state of Arizona. Back in 2004, our mayors recognized our continued growth and success needed continued investment, came back and built a new plan for another 20-year investment strategy, this time multimodal in nature, recognizing the rapidly urbanizing areas and the diverse set of transportation needs throughout the region. Uh, you'll see here the establishment of the 303 corridor, finishing the South Mountain Freeway, in the southwest part of our valley, um, helping to establish light rail and then streetcar in Tempe just a few months ago, having opened. But what you don't ultimately see illustrated on this map is not only the iterative improvements, the added lanes, the building of our HOV network, uh, the transportation um, and traffic interchanges that help to move traffic through and across the region, but in addition to all of those improvements, really important investments in transit, including over 7 million revenue miles of transit service every single year are supported by the region's dedicated half cent sales tax. In addition to that, hundreds of miles of arterial uh, roadway improvements, either extending that grid network, which is a very unique asset we have in this region, carries about half of our traffic every single day. It's also the backbone of our bus transit network and facilitates active transportation, pedestrians and bicyclists throughout the region. Uh, what you also don't see is ADA paratransit that's almost wholly funded by the region uh, to provide those important assets to some of our most vulnerable users to get to medical appointments and across the region. 
Um, you also don't see active transportation investments uh, or investments in technology or ITS, signal timing, um, and safety improvements for which the region's Hessen sales tax ultimately enables. Uh, if you've seen me talk before when I've been here uh, to the Chamber's events, uh, you know how important this is. We use this slide all the time. Saves you on average 25% of your time, just the freeway network alone, each and every year, you get back 25% of your time because of what the freeway network enables for your ability to move across this region. Um, the majority of our jobs are located within a mile or two of a freeway or a high capacity transit corridor. And transportation investments unlock enormous value, and that brings all of us prosperity, as you see here, specifically in Chandler. <clears throat> so when you look over the time frame for our overall transportation investment package, we started this endeavor almost 40 years ago that first established Hassan sales tax back in 1985 followed by Proposition 400 in 2004 with that funding coming online in 2006. It will expire at the end of 2025, which is why we have endeavored over the course of the last four years to build a plan, a long range plan uh, together with the city of Chandler and our 31 other member agencies that is right sized ultimately for our future. What's important to remember is while we talk a lot about the dedicated half cent sales tax because of how instrumental it has been to really enabling all of these transportation investments, it's important to remember that we leverage that funding against other funds that are made available to the region, specifically federal funds that come by way of Washington DC to us, the Metropolitan Planning Organization uh, for both the uh, highway network as well as transit support. In addition to that, our share of the diminishing uh, highway user revenue fund, sometimes referred to as the gas tax, it's important to recognize it's no longer really a gas tax, less than half of the proceeds supporting the highway user revenue fund are coming from the actual fuel sales themselves, and I'll talk a little bit more about really what that it means in terms of an impact of our overall financial portfolio. Uh, I've been here and I've talked about this important plan. This is the illustration of the discrete capital projects that are included in our long range plan. You'll see the completion of our, uh, our, our HOV network, important completions of in corridors in our Southwest Valley, including SR30, also known as the I-10 reliever. That project actually, uh, the middle section of that project was included in Proposition 400 and because of the Great Recession, um, was deferred out of the program because of financial constraint. Completion of the SR24 here in the Southeast Valley, uh, important arterial investments throughout the region, needed major rehabilitation to some of our basic and initial infrastructure, including I-17, um, and the addition, um, similar to what's happening around the Broadway curve right now, another HOV lane uh, up the I-17 to help with our multimodal activities. In addition to that, we're excited to bring a new mode of transportation to the region, bus rapid transit, three different corridors throughout the region, including one on Arizona Avenue here in the city of Chandler, uh, two extensions of light rail west out of the region in the city of Phoenix, two extensions of the newly opened streetcar out of Tempe and into the city of Mesa, really covering some of our densest footprint um, of our urbanized area. And then a number of important traffic interchanges, system-wide improvements, and as I mentioned, important safety investments as well. This slide talks a little bit about the plan itself in terms of a composition of numbers and quantitatively um, what we're investing in as part of this 25-year plan. What I want to make sure to point out is the important programmatic investments. You'll see them in the lower left-hand corner, kind of in that tangerine color. These are the things that we hear the most public support for. These are the quality of life factors that folks, our constituents, routinely tell us are important about what keeps them here living in this region and, and certainly why we continue to see more friends and neighbors uh, coming into this region. Active transportation, uh, putting aside funding to be able to invest in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure for our most vulnerable users, 
Uh, this is a particular priority in this region where we do see a dramatically high crash rate with pedestrians and fatality rate that's much above the national average. Continued investments in modernizing our infrastructure and especially reimagining even some of our arterial investments throughout the region. Continued and expanded investments in safety and technology, setting aside funding for emerging technologies, something that Chandler has been the leader on, something very important to the gentlemen that are sitting in the front row here, um, that recognize that when you're looking to a horizon up to the year 2050, that we need to be nimble for our future, that we don't know all the answers today, and that we want to make sure we're setting aside funding for those technologies and smart solutions of the future so that this region is innovative and on the frontier and not waiting, sitting, not able to take advantage of those technologies and innovations when they come along. But this is all now in question, unfortunately. The dedicated half cent sales tax represents over 50% of our overall funding portfolio. If we are unable to continue the dedicated half cent sales tax, it will decimate the transportation network in this region. And that is largely the message I want to deliver today is I think so many of us have championed and you understand and see the value every single day, including your commute to this workshop today on how important those transportation investments are. Um, it cannot be understated the impact of losing this ability to invest in ourselves into the future. So we've heard a lot of feedback over the course of the last several months. We worked very hard at the legislature this year, ensuring that this got over the finish line. And we're really blessed with a tremendous amount of bipartisan support in both the House and Senate. Almost two thirds of our legislators supporting this initiative, um, albeit close to the finish line of session, um, able to see success in both the House and Senate in sending this bill to the governor's desk. One of the pieces of feedback we've heard from some of those who are opposed to this is that there is a tremendous amount or disproportionate increase in transit. And no doubt we are increasing the amount of funding that we are putting forth in transit. It represents the needs of this growing urbanized region. But really, the largest increase that we have um, invested in as relative to Proposition 400 is in arterials and programs. And the reason that is, is because of the continued financial constraints largely provided or as a result of the diminishing highway user revenue fund. What you'll see here is the illustration of the last 20 years of the highway user revenue fund. So these are the funds that come to the state um not only um, at the gas pump but then the licensing and fees uh, that come through the highway user revenue fund this is adjusted for inflation and so what you'll see here um, is the last 20 years worth of revenues coming into the state for the highway user revenue fund and behind that what you will see is the state's population over that same timeline and ultimately what this is intended to demonstrate is that over the last 20 years, when adjusted for inflation, the state actually received more revenue from the Highway User Revenue Fund 20 years ago than it did last year. And over that exact same time frame, we've increased our population by 40%. Bottom line, you are all using our roadways more and more every single day and literally contributing less to their maintenance and operation, let alone the ability for us to expand the network. Perth back in the 80s was an extremely important revenue source, not just for the region, but for cities and the Arizona Department of Transportation. And we still needed Proposition 300, the dedicated half cent sales tax to start establishing the freeway network here in the region. It is even more critical, the loss of revenue from that dedicated revenue source and what kind of pressure that now puts on our region and without a dedicated or the continuation of the dedicated half cent sales tax will now be uh, uh, placed on local communities to find new revenues to be able to keep pace. There are considerable numbers of impacts associated uh, with not only this diminishing revenue source at a state level, but then the inability even at a local level 
to continue this important tax. <clears throat> First and foremost, this is largely a reflection or this pressure is largely a reflection of the diminishing uh, value of the highway user revenue fund. Um, it also reflects the changing needs and priorities of a rapidly growing urbanizing region. Uh, as mentioned in my introduction, our region's over 10,000 square miles. It is the second largest in the country, uh, includes all of Maricopa County and Northern Pinal County, and we have extremely diverse communities within it, each with very different needs and priorities. And that makes my job really fun, but also extremely challenging when we have to have a diverse portfolio of transportation solutions in our toolbox. More importantly, the work included in this plan really represents quality of life aspects. It's why we continue to live here. It's why we're proud to live here. It's why people continue to move here. And without this continued investment, uh, much of that is at risk. <clears throat> A failure to continue Proposition 400 or this dedicated half cent sales tax will, in fact, result in catastrophic impacts to the region. Um, there will be no new or, or fewer, certainly, new and improved roadways. You'll continue to see the condition of streets diminish as cities have no funding um, to be able to contribute to their maintenance and operations. Um, it'll really limit our ability to respond to economic growth. So the biggest tool we have in our toolbox in this region to bring in quality employment is our transportation network and investment. When you talk to GPAC, when they're doing their locates for big businesses, when we work um, to ensure Intel can continue to expand and provide high quality employment for you in the city of Chandler, they're reliant on the transportation network the region has funded to be able to do that. And that'll be a huge impact to our ability to continue that economic growth. And really the decaying condition ultimately of our assets have a major safety impact as well. The message when we move beyond roads and into transit is even more dire. This is a depiction of the routes, bus routes within the region that are either wholly or partially funded by regional funds or the half cent sales tax. All of those reflected in this tangerine color are now at risk for discontinuing operations starting January 1st, 2026. Transit is not something you get to turn on and off overnight. It requires an ongoing commitment and revenue source to do so. And you'll see particularly the impact here in the East Valley and city of Chandler. The vast majority of bus routes in the East Valley are funded by the region or supported by the region. And that will either put the burden on the city of Chandler and your local communities to come up with a different funding source, or it'll mean discontinuation of transit completely. <coughs> Not only does this mean we'll have, we can't no, we can no longer look at expanding service. It was the top priority we heard from the public, get us better service, more frequent service, better improved service. We're actually gonna have to retract uh, the transit program at this point. Um, it means that uh, we'll have to find a new source at a local level uh, to support the federally required ADA paratransit service that is required to be provided. And it really does limit the ability to expand and stretch the transit network to keep up with the continued growth that we see throughout this region. Now we will move to a few freeway highlights. One of the important messages I hope you take away from today is not only the impact to the future projects and programs that we have identified in our long range plan, but also to current funded projects. Particularly for major capital projects in the freeway program, it takes decades of commitment and planning and environmental work to be able to deliver that infrastructure. And what that means for us now is some of the projects we have at the end of our Proposition 400 program, these last couple of years of our funded program, our, our work, our, our pre-designed work in anticipation of completing the project or constructing the project with the extension of Proposition 400. We do not have that decade, dedicated revenue source. Our policymakers are faced with difficult decisions on whether or not we continue to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in those activities. I wanted just to highlight a couple of those. That includes I-10 widening uh, through the Gila River Indian community. 
That is a project that the Maricopa Association of Governments has had over $225 million waiting uh, to be matched uh, from the state and other resources. Uh, the legislature was very successful this year in passing a $400 million appropriation uh, to marry with that money from the Maricopa Association of Governments, but that still doesn't mean or it is not a fully funded project. So we have to chase for federal discretionary money, which we have in partnership with ADOT and the Gila River Indian community successfully submitted a grant application for. If we do not receive that federal discretionary grant, it will place the burden of completing that project on the region to determine whether or not that $225 million that we already have on that project is still the best case to put that money if we don't have the funding to complete it. You'll see also uh, I-10 baseline road traffic interchange. If you come up through the Broadway curve, you know that that's already a pinch point. Jackrabbit Trail in the West Valley, that is an intersection where uh, traffic is backing up on what we call the main line. So traffic on that exit is coming all the way up and sitting on I-10, and that is a huge safety issue. Also want to point out SR-30. We have dedicated over a half a billion dollars as part of our Proposition 400 program to the advanced right-of-way acquisition and utility work necessary to ensure that corridor is as best prepared as possible, that once the uh, uh, Continuation of the dedicated half cent sales tax is successful at the voter box. We could immediately start bonding against and constructing that facility. Unfortunately, with the veto, that funding is now an uncertain. And because of the long lead time associated with project development activities, we've had to put that effort on hold. Um, that has a couple of consequences. There's some unique utility aspects to the SR30, including working with APS in Palo Verde for a pipeline that goes out and through that corridor. Work on that pipeline can only occur two times each year. And with the veto now, we have to halt that work. And that is, is uh, given us the anticipation of setting that project back at least two years. Ultimately, what that means is uh, inflationary impact that will cost the region between 300 and $400 million alone because of the inflationary impacts that we're seeing at this, uh, at the, in this locale right now. Delaying that project has a real monetary impact and really sets back um, recognized growth for which we're intending to prepare and respond to and now have to sit and wait for. This is the Proposition 400 Extension Freeway Program, just some of the projects that are included in it. And what I wanna highlight in particular is how important these projects are to economic development. You will see major uh, employment corridors and activities occurring throughout the region for which our transportation network has planned to respond to. All of these projects are now in question. So with no sales tax in the region, um, the message I'm here to deliver is the world looks quite bleak. Ultimately, um, without the dedicated half cent sales tax, we will be very limited in our ability to do much of anything as in terms of transportation. The funding that we do have available to us will largely be federal in nature and will be focused singularly on meeting federal performance targets and doing minimal safety improvements throughout the region. The region will be unable to build new freeways and that is a message that I want you to take away. There, will no, there is no other funding source to deliver freeway investments in this state. This region has built the freeway network that you use every single day on its own. That's an important consequence, ultimately, of the veto. There will be no ability to expand um, existing facilities. We won't be able to finish out the HOV network. We won't be able to add out the final general purpose lanes as planned and envisioned over the course of our 30-year horizon. We will not be able to expand the network. And then ultimately, the state and federal resources by themselves will not be sufficient to address the compounding transportation needs in this region. So just a few takeaways as I finish up, the veto has considerable impacts, not just to the long range program and looking to future generations, but it has immediate impacts to our programs today. Project costs will increase because of inflationary impacts, especially with short term needs. Inaction will lead to greater cost burden placed on local communities who are already stretched 
and pinched to be able to deliver basic services, let alone transportation. The loss of the dedicated half cent sales tax will mean the region will be unable to keep up with current, let alone future growth. And we could anticipate most likely that growth diminishing, especially from an economic development level where uh, companies will be much chagrined to come and locate in this region. There'll be significant impacts ultimately to our economic prosperity and quality of life. What I will tell you and uh, what our transportation policy committee leadership, our, our, our uh, chair emeritus and, and Mayor Hartke from last year and our current chair supervisor sellers will tell you the region is committed to finding a solution. We have reaffirmed our commitment to the plan that we spent many years developing together that was unanimously supported by each and every mayor, elected official within the region, and are standing shoulder to shoulder, um, in part because collectively our region represents 65% of the state's population. And we feel strongly to be able to deliver this program on behalf of our constituents. So with this, I'll end with this picture. I love using this in part to um, uh, recognize our leadership. I'm extremely lucky. We at Maricopa Association of Governments have extremely strong local leadership. You'll see the two gentlemen following me pictured here. This is the day that the Transportation Policy Committee unanimously recommended approval of the plan we've built over the course of several years. The Transportation Policy Committee is unique. It is a public-private partnership at the Maricopa Association of Governments codified in state statute, uh, bringing together mayors and business community uh, together to find transportation solutions. And so um, we're really proud of the work that we worked together to do. It was not easy, um, as uh, Mayor Harkey and Supervisor Sellers will talk about here shortly. But we came together to find a plan that worked best for our region and reflected the feedback we got from public. Um, our constituents provide a tremendous amount of feedback over the last couple of years. And that's why when we see polling for the plan, we're not surprised to see it exceeding 70% support. It's because it's built by the public and our elected officials and for which that is why we're committed to finding a solution. So thank you very much. We're going to do Q and A at the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ada. Great information, and you have a way of delivering all of this information that's second to none. <laughs> she does a great job. Thank you. Um, okay, so our next speaker is Mr. Sellers. Um, is from Maricopa County District One Supervisor Jack Sellers. Jack Sellers has served on the Board of Supervisors representing District 1 since February 2019. In November 2020, voters elected him to serve a four-year term on the, board, uh, on the board. Mr. Sellers previously served two terms on the City, uh, City of Chandler Council and continues to serve as the chairman of the Arizona State Transportation Board. He also has a position on the GPEC International Leadership Council the Arizona-Mexico Commission in Arizona Sister Cities. Mr. Sellers believes in improving the quality of life across the region by encouraging a vibrant economy that utilizes technology to ensure we are a smart region. He's an advocate of intelligent infrastructure development and autonomous vehicles, maintaining relationships with MAG, Valley Metro, ADOT, and the Federal Highway Administration. Please join me in welcoming Advisor Sellers. How do you how do you follow Audra? <laughs> uh, well, and again, those of you that know me know that uh, I'm very passionate about this. Um, I, I really always look forward to an opportunity, any opportunity, to talk about how important our infrastructure is for our future here in Maricopa County. So let me let me start by thanking the chamber for inviting me to speak on this topic today. I, I believe it's one of the most pressing issues we may face. I'm also very pleased to see uh, some of my colleagues from the East Valley Partnership here. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so the Proposition 400 Extension Bill was vetoed. What are we gonna do? 
We all agree that Prop 300 and Prop 400 created the transportation and infrastructure system that spurred unprecedented growth. This investment by the region has resulted in billions of corporate dollars necessary to open and operate in this country. Today, this region can compete with Texas, New Mexico, Florida, California, and, or any other state in attracting new businesses. So I can't for the life of me understand why our friends down at the Capitol don't understand how important extending the Prop 400 investment is for our future. But I'm not here to talk about the past. I'm here to help get the resources our county needs to compete and succeed in an ever-changing global economy. As the current chairman of the Mag Transportation Policy Committee and the Maricopa County Supervisor, I'm going to continue working to get a plan in place as quickly as possible. As Audrey talked about, this plan will provide critical infrastructure to support our phenomenal economic growth and maintain the lifestyle that has made us so attractive to employers, employees, and their families. We know that this plan can't address every one of our needs, but a plan that can satisfy a majority of our county voters and is marketable to our business and government leadership is achievable. A lesson I learned while I was serving on the State Transportation Board is that the average person has no idea when they cross a municipal line or a county line. <laughs> they only know where they wanna go and they expect us to have a system for them to get there. The business community also expects a plan that allows them to easily bring in raw materials and ship their finished products. They expect a system that gives their employees choices on their commute. So we really need to have a plan that supports commerce and lifestyle. We must also be ready to invest in rapidly changing technology and take advantage of that technology everywhere possible. I'm not the person who put this plan together. That's why we need experts like Audrey. My job is to help collect information and provide direction on how we move forward from here. How do we get strong and vocal business community support? How do we, how do we work through a strange political environment? And if we miss something in the plan, we cannot forget that timing is absolutely critical. Unfortunately, there are leaders who don't understand how infrastructure planning works. For us to put a plan together, we have to have a known, dedicated revenue source. State law doesn't allow us to have something in our plan without known funding. Since plans and construction are a long-term prospect, we need to project revenue many years in the future to have a plan. That means that if this region wants its fair share of the five-year bipartisan infrastructure act, a trillion dollar act, we need to get the local funding in place now, not two or three years from now. The efforts that Mayor Hartley and I are very involved in, we currently know at least $35 billion in expanded economic activity in Maricopa County. I recently talked to the local vice president of Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, and I'm told that within five years, the current I-17 and Loop 303 interchange will not be adequate for their growth. Mm -hmm. We face a similar situation right here in the East Valley with a known expansion at Intel. Uh, a couple of us toured the Intel facility this week to see their $20 billion expansion going on. And it, until you see something like that up close, you can't even imagine what a $20 billion project looks like. It's incredible. But with that expansion and the, the people that are going to follow that expansion here, the expansion going on at Gateway Airport and more, 
And even, you know, ASU continuing to grow to support the workforce and lifestyle needs of our community, we really need an infrastructure plan. Everywhere I go, companies and people keep telling me that they expect us to handle this. And many of them are telling me that we absolutely need a better transit system to deal with increasing densities as we grow. Some communities don't want light rail as a part of their plan, and we have to be sensitive to that. But we have to retain flexibility for those who want it. One of the questions I'm asked frequently is, why won't our government allow the voters in Maricopa County to tell us what they want? I'm not sure I know. We have over 60% of the population and 70% of the state's economic activity right here in Maricopa County. And we are the only county in the state that needs approval from the state to refer an issue to our voters. We're currently in the process of bringing together key business leaders to help us determine the best approach to achieve a positive result as quickly as possible. Okay, as a reminder, we don't have an infrastructure plan in place today to support business expansion projects that are already underway. The choice is very clear. If we're going to sustain the outstanding economic growth we are currently experiencing, we need to get a Prop 400 extension passed as soon as possible. There are major challenges in getting a viable and marketed plan in place quickly. So we all need to work together and get this done. Our future depends on it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good message. And uh, definitely need to work together to accomplish this. Um, our next speaker is from the city of Chandler, Mayor Kevin Hartke. Uh, Mayor Hartke began his term in January 2019. He previously served nine years on the city council, first as an interim council member, and then was select, elected to cons uh, consecutive four-year terms. Kevin also served as vice mayor twice. Kevin is involved extensively in the estate and region, serving on boards and committees with the Arizona League of Cities and Towns, Maricopa Association of Governments, Greater Phoenix Economic Council, and Regional Public Transportation Authority. He's an ex officio Chandler Chamber of Commerce board member, along with serving as a public policy committee member. Kevin and his wife, Lynn, have been married for 37 years and have lived in Chandler since 1985. He continues to serve as a pastor at Trinity Christian Fellowship in Chandler. He has a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and a master's degree in theology. Please join me welcoming uh, Mayor Kevin Carter. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Well, it's good to be here. Is this loaded, ready to go to? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, in one way, it uh, is a little early to to wonder what to do with this depressing uh, presentation here, and uh, but I, I hope that uh, that you're you're catching the gist that this is something that is more than a faux pas, and and we can collect ourselves. Is that uh, the veto of this plan has has uh, implications that are more than Chandler, it's more than the county, and as Audra shared, is will affect our entire state. Uh, in fact, the entire state's ADOT budget is equal to the amount that Maricopa County is putting into this, and that's the share that the state uh, will be having to pick up if this absent sales tax does not continue. So um, you can digest that for a couple of moments as well. Let's look at the immediate impacts in Chandler, and then I'd like to just talk a little bit about uh, possibly what is ahead. Am I going the right way? Yeah, so in Chandler, uh, we've got a number of things that, that I know that doesn't agree well, uh, that are coming in, in all four of the 
thank you, of the of the sessions in there. But we totally, at, as part of this plan, would be seeing a, a direct and indirect benefit of $1.7 billion that will directly uh, affect our community here. And with that, it's phased out over all of the uh, of the different times of this, but you see whether it's the widening of the 202 and the other types of things are, are certain projects that go on within our city with arterials. As Audra uh, pointed out, our high capacity transit, which is the bus system, is largely, uh, we, we pay into uh, Valley Metro and RPTA, but with that, uh, our entire bus transit system is part of the RPTA, Regional Public Transportation Authority system. And then uh, other regional programs, which come to a, a pretty impressive number. Now, this isn't all money that is totally spent in the in the Chandler, but uh, how many of you drove in this past week or are 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 somehow got in or out of this community? Whether you went to Mesa, Queen Creek, Tempe, how many of you have been outside? Yeah, so just about every one of us here. And if, if you were not a person that visited outside of our community, this. This day, this week, you certainly did last week or will next week. So we're, we're part of a greater region. And a lot of these dollars impact areas that uh, uh, certainly that will impact our ability to, to work, to do what we need to do outside of this community as well. Immediately, as, as you also see with that final number, Chandler's programs and projects include this mixture of regional federal funding. And federal funding to Chandler projects and programs is at risk if this regional funding is discontinued, similar to what was presented across the state. And we'll see that with so many other of the projects that are going on around here. So let's look at a couple of these specifically, our freeway highlights. We've, we've been blessed to see the 202-101, I-10, 60, and SR-24 projects that have been part of this project that have all helped us in the past. We currently uh, planned on a phase one development to that would be part of this, the uh, loop 202 widening between I-10 and uh, the 101. Certainly that new freeway interchange and a couple other direct HOV interchanges. So there's a lot of the freeways that although much of this, this uh, continuance of the furtherance completion of the overall freeway project is certainly out in the West Valley with I-30 and some of those, the I-10, but this directly is not just touching our borders, but is central to our getting around as well. Chandler's been very good in the past uh, in terms of, of being quote, quote, shovel ready to be able to take advantage of federal and regional projects concerning our intersections. And we've had some great traffic folks and as well as our continued with our current folks that have done a fantastic, job of, of putting us in the position to be able to see funds, whether from MAG or from federals. Well, if those funds aren't there, it doesn't matter how great our, our traffic folks are. I mean, they're literally pounding sand, you could say, to try to get money that, that won't be there. But these are, these are also some of the arterial improvements that we're going to see throughout the phases of this project. A phase, by the way, is considered five years. So in this 25-year plan that, we've, that has been put together, these are the timings of those types of projects. Our transit highlights. Certainly, as, as I mentioned, as, as continued by Audra, almost all of our regional bus routes are part of this plan. Our, uh, we're looking at some of our locally uh, funded plans and extensions, the FLEX program right now, that we're currently engaged in as a, as a grant program that we were seeking to codify with further funds. And our Chandler residents and employees depend on transit. You, you see the numbers that are available here. Other programs that will be impacted, we have certainly tried to, uh, to build a transportation system that is more than just vehicles on roads with bike and pedestrian projects. Uh, these other arterial intersection improvements. I've been a big proponent as our community is a is a is a well sophisticated community that is continuing to look for 
alternatives to what we're currently doing and intelligent transportation systems. We've received grants and, and co-funding for some of our light programs, our, our intersection light programs, for example, that are state of the art and continuing to look at how do we press ahead as well as uh, you might have recently heard that Phoenix is doing an intersection study to identify the, where the most crashes have been happening throughout the region and identifying and applying uh, a lot of millions of dollars to do the same to fix these. We've been doing this for years and uh, this will further put that money into risk. So uh, you can see kind of all of those put together on this particular screen and uh, where these will directly affect us. But again, this doesn't take into effect that uh, those of you who will be going to the legacy sports area in, um, in East Mesa or further into Queen Creek, the developments there are the, the other work that will take us in other parts of the valley as well. You, you might say in one sense that we, we dodged the worst bullet because a lot of our immediate systems are, are, for, are completed at this point. Uh, for, uh, we've been blessed in that sense. Uh, Chandler has been ahead of the curve on a lot of things where funding has been affected. When the state changed the impact fees, we were largely done with the use of impact fees in Chandler. And, and you could say immediately within our borders, we're less impacted than some of our neighbors. But again, we're part of a region. And if we just stayed in Chandler, we might be less affected, but all of us travel and need to travel around the region. So just be, before we go into this part, it's, it's obviously extremely important. Jack had mentioned that we're the only county in the state that requires state approval to actually engage in attacks like this. It's important that with our legislators that we unhinge the ability, the need for, for Maricopa County to be able to continue to develop its, its funding and transportation system. That's important. It's important that as we uh, develop this plan, the delay is crucial. And I, and I won't pretend to understand what was in the, um, in the, the mind of our governor, but uh, a ton of work has gone on through years of this. If you could imagine getting all of these mayors together and all of these cities together and transit directors to, to try to buy what's important for their communities. And this process has taken years to agree on a plan that everyone would say, this is the best plan for our community. And then suddenly having worked that through all of the cities, all the transportation districts, to be able to work that through the Senate, work that to the state and what a shock it was. And suddenly this thing was upended. Politicians like to say that those who are closest to the people should make the decisions, right? Okay. Yeah, we all say that and we all agree that that's true until it seemingly is not. <laughs> and this is a, a perfect case like, I like that. And uh, we're seeing what we can do to move forward. I think as a region, I, I speak for every mayor across this county. Uh, our supervisors. At one point, we were wondering what's the what's the best plan forward. But as as Audra mentioned, it's it's not. I, I I wonder if in the governor's brain was the thought of saying, "Well, we'll just let the next group of people pick up this project." Well, the next group of people are less transit and less transportation interested than are further than our current folks. We've had a lot of great statesmen, a lot of great folks who are currently part of our Senate, our legislature, who have been champions of this project, and, and a significant number of them did not make it through the primary. So the, the new uh, class of our Senate and House, many of them are going to be brand new and are not educated as, to the extent that our current folks have been. And many of them have leaned more to the left and more to the right and less, uh, at least on the surface, uh, interested in the collaborative initiatives that this will take. So we've got an uphill battle. Our business community, I can't charge you enough of how strong your voice is and needs to be with our governor because our governors are very business friendly. Our, our coins himself is a very business friendly governor and your voice needs to be heard. Your voice needs to be magnified. Uh, the entire region, in fact, the entire state 
We recently did a presentation just a couple of weeks ago and showing the impact of what will happen if this is not continued to the entire state. Well, suddenly ADOT, who is stressed as thin as they can be with their current funding, would have to double their resources to not just take on projects like this, whether they would decide to, but even the amount of maintenance and continued work that is done in this county that suddenly would fall upon the state, which will affect Yuma, it'll affect Douglas, it'll affect Flagstaff. There's not a single community in this state that is not impacted by this not passing. Or, and again, this not passing, just means that it gives our community, our citizens, the right and the ability to vote whether they want this. So uh, I, I can't say enough, let your voice be heard, let your voice be magnified and uh, help Chandler and the entire county and the entire state get this passed. Let your voice be heard to our governor, our legislators and anyone else. So thank you. All right, so we're going to move on to Q&A. Um, who's got our first question? Jane, let me come over here. Uh, my question would be that, well, one, it, it seems as though this was an excellent plan. No plan is perfect. But it's, you know, what you said, having 65% approval rating, having all the mayors on board with this bipartisan support. I guess the question for me would be, where are those gaps that we can fix? Because it does seem like it was a surprise to everyone. So what would be the plan forward? Because I'd hate to see a watered down plan from the excellent plan that you all have put together. So you can't fix a problem until you know what it is. So I'm wondering if there are things that maybe you're already looking at, or are you gonna take this plan and we move forward with this, with, with basically just changing the way it's communicated or however that process needs to be? I don't know if that was clear, but. Excellent question, Jane. Come over here. Well, obviously, if we're going to do this in a short time frame, we're not going to make major changes to the plan because then it has to go back through all mayors all over again. Uh, I think what we need to do is bring the right people together to talk about what opposition did we face and what caused us to fail and how do we get around that? How do we fix that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the very short term plan is, are there some immediate tweaks that can uh, then be addressed? Some of our legislators, as, as Audra rightly mentioned, you know, had, had some issues with some of the transit, the buses, the light rail, the, the, uh, the, the trolleys are so in Tempe, and, and they have some reluctance and resistance to them. There's really not among the amount of time in a, in a short term plan to say, well, let's just scrap all that and, and, and do everything else. Because again, it's taken years to get this community together to recommend this. But are there some other types of tweaks that are possible? I, I don't think, and, and I, again, I, I, I work well with our governor, but I, I don't think his legacy that he would desire is to leave the state in a transportation shamble. So I, we're hoping that there is some opportunity for all voices to come together. If there's some minor things that could be done, if we have to start over with this plan and then also miss that deadline, again, the, the ramifications that Audra mentioned are, are actually pale compared to the true impacts with inflation and the other things. If you, if you have to stop a project, you no longer acquire land on a freeway that you don't you can't fund. You no longer do the studies on something that you can't do the project. So it it literally is a, a, a grinding uh, halt to start over. So we're trying to communicate that message. And if there are some minor things, those are the negotiation points. Yeah, and let me just give you one quick example of, of, of an area where maybe we didn't do a good job of communicating. You know, the, the mayors and the group uh, that worked on this on this plan recognized that half cent sales tax in 20 years would not put enough things in the plan to get us our critical needs. And so 
the argument became if we increase the amount of the sales tax, it's a tax increase and we can't we can't sell it. We know that through the legislature. Uh, even though this, our citizens might be willing to vote for it, the legislature would not, uh, not, not allow us to put it out to them. So to get the right things in the plan, they said, okay, we can fix this by extending the plan to 25 years, understanding that that gives you the right to bond for that whole time period and gives you the money then up front that says we can have this in the plan and have this to, to satisfy our immediate needs. Uh, you know, part of the veto message was that going from 20 to 25 years was a tax increase. The whole reason we went there was to keep from having a tax increase. So, so I think we need to we need to understand things like that better and do a better job of communicating. Fantastic answers by our leadership. The only thing I would also add on the transit portion is a reminder that we're in an air quality non-attainment area in this region. And what that means is that in order to continue that federal funding flowing to this region, we have to make sure that we're on target for a variety of air quality matters for which we need to continue to demonstrate we're on a trajectory to achieve. Transit is a huge component of ensuring that we are on target and meeting attainment. And taking out transit would put at risk our ability to have now federal funding coming into this region. But more importantly to this audience, that would put at risk the ability to do economic development. The county would not be able to issue permits. And in a community that is the proud home of Intel, who have worked very hard to ensure that important uh, expansion occurred, air quality was one of the biggest hurdles for which Intel needed to achieve because of our non-attainment status. And so when we put together and we talk about this uh, plan that we, we worked on for the last couple of years, it is tremendously sophisticated, not just in terms of cash flow and the funding, the streams of funding that we have available, but also we have to achieve through the Federal Clean Air Act and the ability to demonstrate that we are continuing to be on target for attainment on those varying air quality matters as well. Okay, and I will add to that that, uh, you know, I, and, and the mayor and I both do a lot of this. We talk to a lot of companies that are looking to, to locate here or expand here. And one of the things we hear from many of those companies is you need a better transit system. And, and so, and we're hearing a lot from the public that they want a better transit system as well. So again, that, that's, an, that's an area where we have a problem letting our citizens tell us what we want rather than our state. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that presentation. It was really, it was wonderful. Thank you. As the mayor just mentioned, we're going to have, our elections are coming up in November and we're going to be getting in some new people that are not as informed about this that we're going to be able to, and electing on. So what is it that we can do that you're asking us to actually do to get this passed, to get it for, to do something about Prop 400. If we're gonna have a new legislature in there, a new governor, what is it that we can do that you're asking us to do to get this to happen? So I, I'd say to me, it's one of my, it's one of my grids. You know that I look at are are do we have people who are regional of, of regional interest? But that goes beyond this election. I we're currently working with our the governor's office in trying to uh, have a special session called. I don't know where that's at. I don't. I don't know. Maybe maybe Jen would know more than no. Okay. No. But, <laughs> but I mean that's that is uh, perhaps the easiest solution is can the governor. Does he want this to be his legacy of this transportation plan falling into shambles and then being picked up by some people who's who don't share his interest in in providing infrastructure and and being a pro business person? So uh, that is certainly an angle that that all hands on deck. I know the chamber is 
is weighing in as are all the chambers. So there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of work going on there in audiences to uh, try to see this happen. If if that happens, there is still the possibility of a, a special election being called that could uh, take, there's, there's still the sense of now we're in a state of indecision. So you don't spend money if you, if you don't know where the money is going tomorrow. That would be the best case solution at this particular point. If not, then um, it, it really behooves us to to make this an issue in, in front of everybody in the state who who has a who who wields uh, diplomacy and and authority and that's our business leaders our, our chamber certainly understands us our, our many of our legislators certainly understand this and so it's it's being champions of the message whether it's making phone calls whether it's connecting people of influence of of just saying we've got to get this thing passed. Thank you. Thank you. So, so you're saying that um, might bring uh, the governor to revert his decision and then bring the special action in. Yes. That's a hope. Yes. That's that's a goal. That's a big goal. In one line. Okay. Right, that's the goal. Thank you. That's that was what I. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Are we good? Theory. If the governor has already vetoed this and you're not making any changes to the plan, why would he want to revisit it in a special session? That doesn't make sense. I mean, because he's going to have egg on his face again and he doesn't do anything. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think there's a couple of, of notes and, and Supervisor Sellers mentioned it. I don't know that there was a full understanding of the immediate impact of the veto to the current program. Um, I, I think there's a recognition that the current tax expires in 2025 and we hear uh, you know, anecdotally, well, you have a couple of more years before you actually need to extend the tax. The reality is that that, of course, puts into flux and pauses all this project development work that totals millions of dollars. It needs to occur um, to be able to advance needed transportation projects today into the future. So I think that was one of the areas for which we didn't do a good job communicating that it's not just a, to worrying about infrastructure and investments starting in 2026 and beyond. It's actually hindering or would hinder the ability to do planning work, project development work yesterday. Um, and there's a true consequence to that. And I mentioned the SR30 as a particular example and how that half a billion dollars that we have placed on that project, we have now paused all of that work. And that is that means ADOC has had to stop and halt right away acquisition for which they've worked years in the development for. And that's major developments that are not put on hold. And that consequence is very immediate to those interests. And I think that is now just recognized um, by the state and the impacts of stopping a program um, as large as this one. The bill itself is more than just the plan. The, the plan is, and that is the federal authority of this region to develop. Um, we, we don't get that by the state. Uh, we get that authority by the federal government. The bill itself contains several items and it included, and if you look at the veto letter, a couple other notes, some concerns about the ballot language itself. Those are things that can easily be changed and modified. Uh, the inflationary impact uh, commentary, well, the tax doesn't kick in until 2026, and we can demonstrate how there's inflationary costs associated with delay. So I think there's a couple of aspects that we can address that don't actually touch the plan itself, because when you look at the veto letter itself, there were no commentary about the plan or what's included in the plan. Um, it was perhaps the conveyance or, or what was in contained in the bill that there were some certain issues for which uh, were articulated in the veto letter. So I don't know if you guys have any other. Yeah, one of, the, one of the things I will mention is that we are currently in the process of bringing together what we consider to be the key uh, political and business leaders to talk about what are our options and how can we make this happen as quickly as possible. Uh, we're, we're organizing that right now. So, you know, if, if, there, if there's key things we want people in this group to do, you'll hear from us. I don't need a microphone. Oh, to, to continue on what you're saying, 
um, some Brexit sellers. So the Arizona Free Enterprise Club is one of the biggest lobbyists against this right now, whose you know biggest lobbyist sits on the Gilbert Town Council. And this is a group that claims to represent small businesses and you know. And go um, so while I understand that you know politics brings interesting relationships, um, and we're always not going to agree on everything, um, given the dire need for this funding that has clearly been expressed by every all of our speakers here today, you know how are our elected officials, three of whom are presenting with the Arizona Free Enterprise Club right now, what are you guys doing to go against that lobby publicly? Um, in, in effect to get this passed, get this over the finish line. And is there any business, is there, has there been an impact study yet on how this will affect businesses large and small by GPEC or any of you guys' businesses? And how, how is that getting out to the public? <laughs> oh, easy question. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to fight with their with Free Enterprise Club. Uh, certainly there are things that they do that I like. Uh, my job is to try to <coughs> ensure that we have the correct positive message to answer any questions that they raise about what we need to accomplish. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, I, I don't want to take them on one for one-on-one. -on -one. I just want to address to the public in general and to other elected officials in general areas where perhaps they haven't gotten the right information or areas where uh, where we could help with the understanding of what they're saying. I just asked Audrey, there, there is, <laughs> I wasn't sure where we're at with that, but there is right now going on, what is the implications on the business community, the impact from this? And, and again, I, I think as logical people, we want to be driven by data and, and not by political sentiment. And I believe that I, we chose to be here rather than at, at the Free Enterprise Club. And, and again, I've, I've, got, I've got friends and, and others and, and we all work with those. Uh, I, I work with many of those folks all the time, but I, I, I do believe this is an area that, that they missed. And, and I, I think sometimes we, we don't understand the, the the full impact of our actions or or what's going to come, and I and I think this is clearly one is that nobody wants Arizona to be a city known for potholes, known for failing transportation systems, our bridges, and and anyone who is a proponent of business, uh, if, if they if they pause, they clearly understand the need and the importance of infrastructure. So I, I think there's messaging that continues to need to go out to all of our, our friends across the state. But an impact study is being done now by Mag. All right. Any other questions? Are we good? Oh, Rick? Oh, OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. How about a round of applause for our panel? You know, as a current chair of the chamber, as well as a business person, I've lived here for 50 years and watched Prop 300 and Prop 400 come through. And I get very frustrated by people who really don't want to look at the details and the evidence. And when the chart was shown up here about the original freeway system and people, you know, the, the valley grew in, in leaps and bounds from 1990 to 2000, then again from 2010. 2010 till 20. And without these projects, the place is going to shut down. Businesses aren't coming here. I, I run an organization on the West Coast, and we're a national organization. And, you know, Texas and Colorado and all these other states are being very aggressive with what they're doing. And, you know, it, it's like the water issue. You know, if we don't have quality drinking water, and Chandler's done a great job, Mayor Harkey, you know, council member seller is when we, we served on council. Those are super important things. Businesses aren't going to come here and the quality of life. And, and I get frustrated. And the question about elected officials and other things going on, when you go to the ballot box, look at who's running, ask those tough questions on, you know, this is not an increase. in I, I love the line about this is an increase in taxes. No, it's not. It's a continuation <laughs> of what's been going on. Audra brought up a really good point. The, the inflationary problems by waiting now, you know, 
I deal with the bond market. The bond market is going to touch anything right now. They basically are going to shut off what's going on in the state because they're not going to take a risk of issuing bonds that may not be able to be paid back for, or the rates are going to go up. So all of a sudden, instead of paying three or four or five percent, you might be paying eight and nine percent in terms of because they're considered junk bonds. So um, look at the ballot. You know, encourage phone calls to people. Um, I was shocked as well as everybody else was the government vetoed this because my feeling is that the people vote on to make that decision. So anyway, um, we have some elected officials here. I got to turn this page here so I make sure I get everybody. Um, John Lewis is here, former mayor of Gilbert, who's president of the East Valley Partnership. So welcome, gentlemen. We also have normally have a city update. Terry, am I missing other people? Are there any other elected officials other than our city people here? No? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Jen's here. Okay. Um, Jennifer Pollack from the state legislature review. I know is a big supporter of our chamber as well. We have a couple of city elected officials who maybe want to do anything update on the city of Chandler. I'll start with the vice mayor. Anything, Terry, in terms of updates from the city? I think that this has just been a great meeting, very informative. Um, Public needs to hear it, however, however that can happen. So beyond that, thank you to the chamber for continuing to try and provide programs. Great, thank you. Thank you. Christine, anything from you from the city? Um, nothing new. We're working really diligently to get things passed and pushing things forward. Our economic is very strong, as you heard from the mayor. Uh, we're looking forward into doing different uh, things. We're in some great ideas to the table. Our traffic people are here. Um, we have uh, our intergovernment people are here. They are working with those that are down uh, in the uh, legislature and also the Senate to see where we're going to go with this. I think for me personally at this point is this better it needs to stop, whether it's uh, my side, your side. At the end of the day, the people of uh, Arizona are the one who's going to be paying for this and uh, feeling that they are getting the squeeze because they are not able to advance the quality of life. Uh, it, 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 it is a comment on every single one of us in here who have a voice. When we live here today, what we have learned, we put it in a context of non divisive way to explain it to others, to bring people to the table for us to have a community talking about things that we want to move forward with. Just like the natives did. Um, they saw the, the common good and they came and they make it happen. And this is, Chandler is in the forefront of that. We are that voice of reason and we will continue to be that voice of reason to make sure that people come together and get things done, period. Great, I appreciate that. Mayor, anything on what's going on in the city? I see my time. You see your time. <laughs> Great, thank you guys. Uh, we couldn't do this without um, our sponsors. I do want to thank all our elected officials who came today, but our sponsors, Air Products and Chemicals, Salt River Project, Dignity Health Chandler Regional Medical Center, Intel, Catalyst Computer Technologies, Southwest Gas Company, Edward Jones Investment, Terry McGivin, APS, Dragon Walk, Fine Chinese Restaurant. Thank you everybody for being here today and have a great rest of your day and a great weekend.